Nope. Not. Okay, so the next speaker is Ross Dempsey, whose name appeared in the previous talk, but he'll talk about something different. A joint PCD tool at Prime Great, yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks for this great workshop and, and the chance to present this. Um, so, yeah, I'll continue the discussion of computational methods for, for 2D gauge theories, but with a, a very different target, um, adjoint PCD2. And this is work with, with Igor, with Loki Lin, and, and Silvio Puku. Silvio Puku. Uh, so just some brief motivation and an overview for uh, adjoint QCD. Uh, we know that large N gauge theories in, in two dimensions will uh, confine test quarks. Uh, and so we might ask, how can we make that a little bit more similar to, to 4D gauge dynamics? Uh, and one thing we might want to do is, um, like in four dimensions, uh, have a dynamical particle transforming in the edge representation. Um, four dimensions, that's, that's the gluon. Uh, in two dimensions, we have to add it in ourselves. Uh, and so we can consider adding in uh, a, a single adjoint Majorana fermion, this, uh, this psi here, uh, added to the gauge theory. Uh, and so if we do this, we, you know, now we have a dynamical particle transforming in the adjoint. Um, we can think of it almost like a, like a gluino. Um, and, uh, and there was uh, work going back to the 90s with uh, David Gross and, and Igor um, showing that sort of surprisingly, uh, when you have a massless uh, adjoint fermion, it will actually screen uh, test quarks uh, so that the effective quark anti-quark potential uh, looks more like um, the plot here leveling off at infinity instead of a, a confining potential. And this has been revisited in, in some recent work, um, including some, some work we did using DLCQ uh, discrete light cone quantization to study the spectra of these uh, theories. Uh, and so we might ask, you know, can we take the next step to make it even a bit more um, physical by, by dropping the large N assumption and going down to finite N? Uh, and so this was actually also considered um, back, in, back in the 90s, and DLCQ does work in principle, um, but as I'll show you, it's actually a, a bit harder than it looks. Um, there are some, some difficulties in, in getting a, an orthonormal basis of physical states in a way that I'll describe. Uh, and, and so here I'll show how we can actually circumvent this problem um, and use DLCQ to get high resolution spectra for these theories at, at finite n and, and very small n, yeah, SU2, SU3 sort of theories. Okay, so let me uh, give a brief overview of DLCQ. Uh, the main idea is we take this two-dimensional gauge theory and then compactify uh, a null direction to, to a length L. Um, after doing that, we can integrate out uh, the gauge field since we're in two dimensions. Uh, and we have an effective sort of Hamiltonian um, for the, the fermion matter left over. Uh, and so we can uh, construct gauge invariant uh, states uh, for these fermions out of um, uh, momentum uh, mode operators, these B dagger IJ operators that are modes of the adjoint fermion. Uh, and so what we'd like to do is, is uh, enumerate all the other states we have uh, and diagonalize this Hamiltonian. It's still an infinite problem at this point, um, but we can make it uh, finite by uh, fixing one of the one of the two momenta, um, the momentum winding around the null circle, uh, and we can fix it in units of one over the uh, the length of that null circle, uh, and then take the uh, the null circle length to infinity, decompactifying, uh, so that we'll uh, recover a continuum spectrum. Okay, so that that's generally true. Uh, let me compare large and finite n. Uh, you know, the first difference you might think of is that for large n, we have factorization, for finite n, we don't. Uh, and so when we go to finite n, uh, we're going to have terms in our effective Hamiltonian that break and join strings. Uh, so we can, well, at large n, we can restrict to states built from a single trace of these operators. Uh, for finite n, we have to include the multi-trace states. Um, this is not great from an American point of view, but it's fine. Uh, the, the growth in number of states is, is under decent control. Uh, we have big computers, so this is fine. Uh, not a problem. What is a problem is that factorization also implied for us uh, that at large n, the states we wrote down were, were immediately orthogonal and easy to normalize. Um, and so in particular, we know that they're all uh, not null. Um, at finite n, this is not the case. Uh, the states are not orthogonal. And computing the inner products, uh, while conceptually simple, uh, the computational difficulty grows factorially in this parameter k. Uh, so we're really sort of stuck uh, if we want to do this uh, at finite n. So, so this is the problem we're trying to solve. One approach is to ignore the problem. Um, and you can get away with this in a certain regime. So if you want to study n that is finite, but still very large, say SU100 uh, theories, uh, you can do this. And, and uh, even though your basis is not worth the normal, you'll get the correct eigenvalues. And this is what was done in, in the 90s. 
Um, the difficulty is when you want to go to small n, uh, because not only were those states not orthogonal, they weren't all uh, physical. Many of them were null. Uh, so for instance, the two states I had on the previous slide, uh, very non-obviously, are actually the same in SQ2, not for higher n, but for SQ2, uh, the single trace state and this multi-trace state are identical. Uh, we could prove it by taking its norm, showing that it's zero, but again, that's hard to compute. Uh, at higher k, that's just not going to work. Um, uh, and, and to show you that we really need to, to do this to show the magnitude of the problem, we can use representation theory to count, uh, not to enumerate, but simply to count uh, the, um, the number of physical states, the ones that are not null. And I've chosen a representative range of, of k here, um, say up to k equals 25, which is a pretty good uh, place to be for the continuum limit. Uh, and so for large n, there are you know, 28,000 states we would write down. For SU3, SU4, only several thousand of them are physical. For SU2, less than 100 are physical. So we really, really need to solve this problem if we want to have an honest DLCQ approach to these small n uh, theories. So let me give you an example of, of how we can do this without uh, uh, computing inner products. Um, in SU2, uh, in, in the Lie algebra, you can show that if you anti-commute two elements, you'll get their trace times the identity. Um, great. Uh, if we select these x1 and x2 carefully, um, taking x1 to be one of our uh, creation operators and x2 to be some combination that still lives in the, in the algebra, uh, we'll find some relation among these operators. Um, and then if we uh, contract it with some other operator to get uh, gauge invariant combinations, um, we actually you know, have chosen these carefully such that we find exactly the relation we want, that the, those two gauge invariant operators are equal. Uh, and so we could um, you know, imagine sort of automating this and removing all the null states in SU2 via this method. Uh, to generalize this to higher n, uh, we notice that this relation star is actually what you get if you uh, take the Cayley Hamilton theorem and apply it to a general uh, SUN element. This is for SU2. For other n, you just get more complicated looking relations, um, but you can still write them down and then sort of consider all choices of the operators and find all null states. Uh, and so this is, this is how this works. Um, so very briefly, what we do is if we want to do DLCQ at, at some k, we break <laughs> this into many subproblems that come down to uh, finding a lot of, of null states. Um, we can use the representation theory to uh, count how many null states we're looking for, and then just start enumerating all those Cayley Hamilton relations. Um, it is taxing uh, because it's a highly ill-conditioned problem to find the independent relations, but nevertheless, uh, we, can, we can grind this out and, and find uh, the, the null states. So then we can remove those from our basis um, and, and find the actual physical basis that we're looking for. And from there, it's, it's DLCQ as usually done. Uh, and so we can compute these operators um, and diagonalize them to find spectra. And so I'll show you now the, the spectra that we have for these, uh, these small M theories. So we'll actually start with SU3. Uh, so for SU3, uh, we have, um, uh, so we're at, this is K equals 30 is the parameter. Um, and several aspects of the spectrum are already quite well conver converged, in particular, these, these bound states. Uh, so we have a fermion of mass squared 5.7, another fermion of mass squared 17.2, a boson of mass squared 10.8, uh, and then a continuum if it appears to begin at a mass squared of 22.9. Uh, we, we should interpret this as um, four times this lowest fermion. So this is a two-particle continuum of, uh, of the fermion. And I should have said, this is the one over the decompactification parameter. So as we move to the left here, we're, we're moving closer and closer to the continuum limit where we see the physical spectrum. Okay, so we can do this for SU3. We can also do it for SU4, and I'll show you that as well. Um, looks quite similar. Uh, exactly the same values of these bound state masses, exactly uh, the same value of the continuum up to the resolution of this plot. Uh, and in fact, if we go all the way to large n using you know, previous data um, computed for large n, uh, still, the bound state spectrum appears to be the same. Uh, these two fermions, a boson, and then the continuum beginning at 22.9. Uh, and so a first question you might ask is, is it literally the same? Are we seeing any uh, end dependence here? Um, uh, and so if you look much more closely at these values, there actually is dependence. Um, so this is uh, now as a plot of 1 over n squared. Um, so the left-hand side is, is uh, large n, and we're moving towards finite n to the right. Uh, and if we plot the masses, mass squares of these, uh, of these uh, three bound state particles, uh, we do see that they depend very nicely linearly on one over n squared. So we're seeing the type of corrections we'd expect to develop um, for this uh, sort of pure uh, adjoint gauge theory. Uh, but they're just very small in magnitude. You can see they're of order 10 to the minus three, which is why the plots didn't look like they were changing very much. Um, okay, let me just briefly discuss uh, SU2. SU2 is a bit different, as you could probably see from those counts before. Um, 
for any n, they're smaller. For SU2, they're way smaller. Uh, and so for k equals 50, for instance, uh, there are over 4 billion large n states you could write down, and less than 3,000 are physical. Um, so you really wouldn't want to be trying to write down, you know, 4 billion, 600 million, 296,000 relations out of the 4 billion total. Uh, it would be much better to work directly with the physical basis. Um, SU2 is also sort of a, a nice group in which we can uh, do this rather tractably. Uh, we can consider the SU2 adjoint as if it were an SO3 fundamental, um, and then uh, and then reorganize our states in terms of rather than traces of uh, uh, of these B daggers, we write them in terms of SO3 invariant in tensors. Um, so we get these sort of tensor networks of epsilons uh, connected to our, our creation operators, and then we can try to compute the mass squared operator, in particular the p minus momentum mode, uh, in terms of these states. It is harder, but still better than working with four billion states. Um, and so we we can do this. Uh, and this actually lets us push the uh, push the numerics to higher k than we could even get to for um, for, for large n. Uh, and, and so here is a is the spectrum of SU two computed now up to uh, up to k equals sixty, uh, so higher than we can get for anything else. Uh, we can see some features are similar. Uh, we have a, a fermion at five point seven, again a boson at ten point eight. We're missing the fermion that was there at seventeen point two. That's because it was charge conjugation odd for the other theories, and, and we can't have that uh, in SU two. Um, we do get an extra fermion at 25.4. Um, we're interested in where this comes from. It's uh, curious. It could be possibly a bound state of the continuum, but we're, we're not yet sure. Um, and then we see a two-particle continuum uh, for, for the boson starting at four times uh, the fermion mass squared. And this fermion continuum is corresponds to the two-particle continuum of these two states. Um, so all these features are sort of very nicely converge um, and seem to match uh, what we might expect. Okay, so to, to sort of wrap up, uh, we can we can do DLCQ at, at small n for, for these uh, gauge theories using this Cayley Hamilton method. Um, the one of Ren squared corrections are, are quite small, but seem to be um, seem to work pretty nicely. Um, SU2 is distinct both physically and, and computationally because we can think of it as this SO3 theory with a fundamental. Um, and going forward, you know, we'd like to better understand uh, the one of Ren squared corrections. One, why they're so small, and, and two, can we sort of uh, develop them more analytically? Uh, and two, um, you know, we can see what happens when we add fundamental fermions. The same computational methods should apply, but then we can actually consider uh, sort of mesonic states and, and the string breaking and the string tension in those states. Um, so that will be of good, of great interest. Thank you. Very much. I think this should really dissuade large and at least a one-dimensional like. <laughs> uh, question. So did you try to play around also with the adjoint mass? Or? Indeed, yeah, I didn't show that here. But um, so one of the most interesting values of the adjoint mass is when it's um, equal to, to g squared n over pi, in which we have um, a supersymmetry uh, of the spectrum. Um, and we do see that very precisely. Um, I can show you other plots. So the yes, exactly. So, Correct. Yeah, so you see you see trajectories for both on the fermions approaching the very same uh, values in the continuum. For large masses, is it problematic? Or, uh... it, it can be done. Um, the idea is so I think for, for larger masses, you'll uh, you'll end up with um, if, if you think of well, if you think of, it, of you know quark antiquark states just conceptually, they'll be closer and closer to the bottom of some potential, and so you'll need higher k to resolve them. Uh, so eventually you see a problem, but we can still get to fairly high masses um, and other works, and it works okay. Just about this phrase that says U2 is same as SO3 with fundamental. I'm a bit confused because when you have fundamental quarks, you would think it's like 12 models. So you just have two quarks in the string between them. Then if it's an adjoint, they can put as many quarks as they want on the string. So how do the pictures map into each other? That's true, yeah. Um, I, I mean, when I say it's uh, SO3 with the fundamental, I, I well, I more mean in terms of how we do the, the computations. But, but nevertheless, um, yeah, we, we can still think of if you have uh, you know, SO3 quark, anti-quark, um, sort of similar to in the Springer model, you can sort of polarize the uh, um, the uh, space between them um, and have a sort of string like that. You know, all the states are multi traces of two two bodies. Right? Some of them are like barons, probably. Right? So and then that's you. Yeah, right. Oft was able because he took large and first he was able to truncate just one, but mm -hmm. here. Uh, so it's like multi traces. Multi traces yeah. of two, two yeah, bodies. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. That's this big simplification. When you mentioned string breaking with fundamentals in DLCQ, can you compute like Polyakov loop correlators or is it sort of restricted to local? 
So not super directly, um, but uh, you know, in, in some other theories, we, we have ways of extracting like the uh, the asymptotic behavior of the, of the quark anti-quark potential um, from DLCQ spectra. Just sort of thinking of uh, you know, if we see some spectra, if it comes from some potential, we can sort of back that out. Um, but just sort of direct, directly computing something like a Polyakov loop uh, correlator is, is um, beyond what we've been able to do thus far. There is no real string breaking here. It cannot break. But oh, definition. but I, I but, meant with fundamentals. But the, but the potential. Oh, you mean with fundamentals? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you again. <laughs>